Well, I have a confession to make you guys. It's something I've been hiding from the channel for about a year now, and it's really time that I come clean. Yes, that's right, I am a Subaru owner. And that means from now on, this channel is 100% IPA reviews and competitive vaping tips. Okay, maybe that was an exaggeration, but from now on, this channel is gonna have more Subaru related content, including this video here. So strap on that flat brimmed cap, because we're gonna talk about my first ever Subaru adventure. Now, this isn't gonna be a full review of the vehicle, so I'm not gonna go too far in depth about the pros and cons or general features uh, handling or anything like that, but I will say uh, my vehicle is a 2021 Subaru Crosstrek Sport in plasma yellow pearl and uh, it has the uh, 2.5 liter FB25 flat 4 engine and the CVT with flappy paddles. Back in August of 2021 I ordered this Subaru and uh, two months later, I picked up the car from the dealer with six miles on the odometer. Now, I ordered this particular car because I wanted something sort of wagonish, but uh, something just a little bit more rugged than your average wagon, maybe a little taller clearance, um, a little bit more suited for camping and something I could use for kind of occasional light duty towing. And that's the subject of this video. And uh, last but not least, I wanted something that came in interesting colors because today your color selection is kind of limited. I mean, it's getting better, but uh, the plasma yellow pearl is really cool to look at in person. So that was a big thumbs up as well. Now, Subaru pretty well nailed uh, that target with the sport trim of the Subaru Crosstrek. Uh, the Crosstrek is based on the Impreza's platform. Um, it comes with two engine choices, a 2.0 liter uh, FB20, and the engine in my vehicle, which is slightly more potent, it's the 2.5 liter FB25. Now the sport trim slots in just below the more luxurious, more tech-centered, uh, limited trim. Um, and the Sport trim is the lowest trim that you can get that comes with that larger 2.5 liter motor, which hopefully uh, makes for a slightly more potent towing vehicle. Towing can be a very dangerous exercise when uh, the manufacturer guidelines aren't followed. So this part of the video is where I need to inform you to follow all manufacturer guidelines for towing with your particular vehicle. Tow safely, my friends. Now, Subaru doesn't really advertise the Crosstrek as a towing machine, but uh, if you've ever driven in Europe, you know that really anything can be a towing machine. And uh, Subaru, like other manufacturers, has a lower tow rating for its vehicles uh, here in America than it does for some of the same vehicles in its European and Australian markets. For the American market only, Subaru of America says that the maximum towing capability of any non-hybrid Crosstrek is 1,500 pounds. Meanwhile, the lowest towing capability of any Crosstrek sold by Subaru Europe is 1,200 kilograms, which works out to approximately 2,600 pounds. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of why there's such a discrepancy between European and American market Subarus, except to say there's no mechanical difference between the two, and uh, that really just boils down to mostly legal, regulatory, and cultural reasons. And on the guidance of my legal counsel, Look, buddy, I know a lot about the law and various other lawyerings. Follow manufacturer guidance at all times when towing with your vehicle. I mentioned earlier that I'm looking for some light duty towing. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm thinking mostly things like teardrop campers for some fun camping experiences. Um, but I also knew that when I ordered this vehicle that I would be moving cross country in the near future. And I really wanted to make sure I could be able to throw a bunch of stuff in a U-Haul trailer and tow on the back of the Subaru. Sorry, I'm making a go of it in a new city. So sure enough, about 10 months later, uh, I ended up moving cross country. And uh, before my adventure, I read up on others' experiences towing with their Subaru Cross Treks, uh, looked into towing accessories, towing stuff in general, and decided to make some upgrades and purchases uh, to help tow a U-Haul with my Crosstrek. Basically, uh, I created what you might call a DIY tow package for my Crosstrek, and that consisted of the following. Uh, number one, a Class 3 tow hitch. Number two, a transmission cooler for the CVT. 
Uh, number three, a scan tool uh, to monitor engine vitals along the way. And number four, a rear camera. And so now I'll get into the details of that DIY tow package. So Subaru of America sells a tow hitch as a vehicle accessory that can be installed at the dealership on the Crosstrek. And to do this, they'll pop off the rear bumper cover, take off the crash bar on the Crosstrek, and bolt in a new tow hitch that serves double duty as a tow hitch and a crash bar. And as part of that service, they wire up a flat four pin electrical connector, also called a four way connector, which is pretty much the industry standard when it comes to trailers uh, that aren't equipped with their own braking system. And that's what the U-Haul trailer I was using had at least. Now all that sounds pretty good, except for the fact that Subaru's trailer hitch is not properly sized to tow any U-Haul trailer. Um, Subaru's trailer hitch is a class one hitch uh, rated for 1,500 pounds. And that happens to be the maximum towing capacity for the Crosstrek, according to Subaru of America. But it also has a one and a quarter inch receiver, which is designed for a one and a quarter inch trailer ball. And U-Haul trailers, they require a two inch trailer ball at minimum, also with a minimum rating of 2,000 pounds. So simply put, the standard Subaru trailer hitch is too small for the U-Haul, even when you're staying within Subaru's towing guidelines. So I ended up having to install a Class 3 trailer hitch with a 2-inch hitch receiver from eTrailer. And because the Class 3 trailer hitch mounts beneath the Crosstrek, I had to additionally buy and install a rear bumper reinforcement since there now was nothing behind the bumper protecting the car in an accident. So yeah, a lot of work went into uh, getting the hitch system right for the Subaru Crosstrek. Um, if you do order Subaru's own hitch, uh, make sure to tell the dealer uh, to leave the original bumper reinforcement in the trunk of the car. Um, after all, you paid for it and you might still need it in the future like I did. So one thing that came up consistently in my research about uh, the Subaru Crosstrek and towing concerns with the vehicle um, was that uh, constant variable transmission or CVT. Um, it seemed like it might be the weak link in the entire towing system. You know, I didn't read anything catastrophic happening like the CVT exploding, but I did read a few stories about people um, overheating their CVT fluid uh, to the point where a light would come on in their dash and the engine computer would throttle back the engine a bit. And that seemed pretty inconvenient and uh, something to avoid. Interestingly, the CVT in the Crosstrek does come with a fluid cooler. It's mounted off on the, uh, the passenger side of the transmission. Um, it's pretty small and it's designed to exchange heat uh, with the engine coolant system. And Subaru describes this part themselves as a warmer and a cooler, which means it's supposed to bring the transmission up to temperature pretty quickly. I couldn't find any specific transmission cooling kits tailored for a Crosstrek, but Mishimoto sells a CVT cooler kit for the WRX of the same year. And since both cars have very similar transmission coolers and are built on the same platform, you know, I'd figure I'd be able to install the Mishimoto kit without any issue. And that was, for the most part, true. First off, the cooler is massive. It takes up something like a quarter of the surface area uh, in front of the radiator. Um, and something of that size really seems better suited for uh, track duty than the sort of light duty towing that, that I had in mind. And unfortunately, the brackets uh, that came with the kit uh, meant for the WRX, they didn't line up in any substantial way to the uh, crash structure or the front structure on the cross track. Really nothing lined up. So to that end, I drilled a hole to mount the top brackets, but I was unable to find a good solution uh, for the bottom bracket and ran out of time and energy, but uh, hey, it, uh, it works. I wanted to keep tabs on CVT temperature and other sensors while towing. So to that end, I got an OBD2 scanner called ScanGage2, and that prints out four vehicle monitors at a time and has a ton of other features. The three monitors I was interested in were transmission fluid temperature, engine oil temperature, and engine coolant 
temperature. Out of the box, the scan gauge was only able to uh, monitor the engine coolant, but I was able to program it to read out the other sensors eventually. So programming the scan gauge to read those other sensors was a tedious process, and it wasn't really well documented by scan gauge themselves, but I was able to track down codes for transmission fluid temperature and engine oil temperature elsewhere on the internet. And so to preserve the sanity of the Crosstrek towing community out there, I'm gonna go ahead and put those on the screen for you right now and include those also in the description of this video. The only other negative I would say about the scan gauge is that it occasionally interfered with Subaru's Starlink system. Now that hasn't bricked the Starlink system or engine computer or anything like that, but I regularly get warnings that the emergency services like the automatic crash notification uh, and SOS features are not working. So, well, there's that. In the past decade, camera technology has gotten a lot smaller and a lot less expensive. And the backup camera aftermarket has really exploded because of that. There are a ton of options at a ton of price points, um, but that also means it can be difficult to narrow down choice for your application. Now my use case was a little different than uh, most camera systems I came across. I didn't just want this camera for, for backing up. I also wanted this camera on constantly to monitor uh, the rear of the vehicle and the trailer and also the huge blind spots I would have while towing. Um, so I settled on a system called Do Honest from Amazon. And you know, for a really odd name, it uh, did exactly what I needed it to. I had to cut a few cables and sort of in a very long extension that went from the power plug and the dash out to the car and all the way back to the back of the trailer, but it worked even in rain and even at night. Now the one big negative about the rear facing camera system was even on the dimmest setting, uh, the light from the monitor would interfere with the eyesight system at night. and. Uh, that eyesight system would respond by turning itself off. Now I'm not a big fan of Subaru's eyesight system, but I do appreciate its collision avoidance features. Um, so I just adapted by giving a lot of space and driving extra carefully. And that rounds out my DIY towing package. So now I'll tell you about the U-Haul trailer itself and also the overall towing experience. For a cross country move, I picked out the uh, five foot by eight foot U-Haul trailer. And the night before picking it up, I uh, made the mistake of reading uh, all the horror stories and, and negative reviews about uh, people with whole houses to move, showing up to their U-Haul centers and finding that the box truck they rented didn't actually exist. That sounded like fun. Now, when I went to the U-Haul center in the morning, uh, fortunately, uh, luckily, uh, that five foot by eight foot trailer did exist. And uh, the U-Haul rep was there. They hitched it up to the cross track, plugged in the lights, uh, secured the safety chains, checked the tire pressures, and generally just made sure I was ready to go. Just before all that, I went down to the local Harbor Freight and picked out a two inch ball hitch with a 500 pound tongue weight and a 5,000 pound towing capacity. You can buy ball mounts that drop the ball or raise the ball by any number of inches, but I thought the safe bet would be to just get the one without any drop or rise at all and uh, see how that works with the U-Haul trailer. And really it worked very, very well. You know, after connecting it up, I think any drop could possibly drag the safety chains and any rise would have added some additional instability. So really that was the best choice. How you load that trailer is very important as well. Uh, the more imbalanced the load, uh, the more the trailer will sway behind the tow vehicle. And so any weight imbalance really just gets magnified the faster and faster that you drive, which can lead to some really catastrophic situations at high speed. Uh, not safe, not safe at all. So once again, my lawyers advise me that it's best to follow U-Haul's guidance when it comes to loading their own trailers. I'm not an executioner. I'm just the best goddamn bird lawyer in the world. U-Haul's instructions for the trailer call for loading 60% of the weight in front of the axle and then 40% behind the axle. This somewhat contradicts the information I've read elsewhere saying that you really should put the heaviest up on top of the axle, 
Uh, so I cut the difference. I put the heaviest items right over the axle and still put about 60% of the weight up front and 40% in back. And you know what, this worked perfectly. I had no swaying at all, even at highway speeds. Speaking of speed, uh, the Crosstrek really didn't have any trouble uh, getting up to highway speeds or merging onto the interstate. Um, though when I was merging, I did make ample use of the flappy paddles um, to keep the engine at the top of its power band, and that helped out a lot. The Crosstrek didn't struggle up any inclines, but it also didn't dominate any hills either. Um, I'd generally be able to uh, keep up with the speed limit by downshifting with the flappy paddles, but uh, having said that, uh, the maximum interstate highway grade is 6% and I don't think I encountered anything over 4% over the whole road trip. Um, so this wasn't an extreme case uh, by any means. Rolling down those inclines wasn't that stressful either for me. Um, I made ample use of the manual shift mode on the transmission and the flappy paddles to drop the gears a couple times and do some engine braking. Um, and if you're towing anything at all in this vehicle, I really do recommend making use of that manual transmission mode um, and the flappy paddles and, and downshifting a gear or two um, because it can really reduce a lot of wear that you're putting into the brake pads while you're towing, but also it can make, help make sure the uh, brakes don't uh, run too hot. So have plenty of brake if you run into like a sticky situation. Most of what I set up to this point has been qualitative but uh, since I had the scan gauge reading out the transmission, engine, oil, and coolant temperatures, I did have some data for you about how the car was doing through this entire adventure. So here we go. As a baseline on flat terrain, in sort of the high 80s, low 90s ambient temperature um, on the interstate at interstate speeds with no towing, um, the engine oil would stabilize at around 200 degrees Fahrenheit and the, the engine coolant would stabilize at about 193 degrees Fahrenheit. And while this was going on, the CVT really seemed to want to stay around 160 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and that's with the Mishimoto CVT cooler installed. So really what this tells me is that the primary function of the stock CVT cooler and warmer is to uh, bring the CVT up to temperature and keep it around 160 degrees rather than cool it. Um, otherwise, I think the CVT temp would be closer to the engine coolant temp during normal operation. Now towing with a full trailer at highway speeds, again, on flat terrain, um, the engine oil ran a little bit warmer at 208 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the engine coolant temp fluctuated a bit more as well, but you would expect that since there's a thermostat in there that regulates how much coolant goes through the radiator. Um, but it, again, it chose to rest at 193. Did sometimes go up to 197. Um, the CVT, on the other hand, uh, did run a little warmer while towing but still well within the range of normal at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Like I said earlier, most of this trip was flat except for some portions of Eastern Pennsylvania that I went through. But uh, even then I never exceeded a 4% grade on the road. So the most challenging bit of road, I ran the engine up to about 5,000 RPM and had to hold it there for about two minutes while I was going up a hill. And as a result, the highest engine oil temperature I ever read on this entire trip was 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Now supposedly you'll get a warning light at above 260, so really this is only a touch warm and not really any cause for concern. At the same time, the engine coolant temp peaked at around 210 degrees, and uh, 220 is about the warmest you ever want that engine coolant to get. Um, and at 228 it'll start to boil, so again, uh, that's just a touch on the warm side, but still within the range of normal. Now in these same conditions, the hottest the CVT fluid ever got was 190 degrees Fahrenheit, which essentially is nothing. Um, the CVT temp warning light comes on at 257 degrees, so really that's well within the range of normal and not even a touch warm. You know, I've seen people report uh, similar CVT temperatures when just cruising around town in slightly warm weather, so really it doesn't move the needle that much towing with the CVT cooler. So what all this tells me is that the Mishimoto CVT cooler for the WRX is really totally overkill for the Subaru Crosstrek, it, ridiculously overkill, um, even in towing conditions. And you know, I'm sure the capacity in there is handy if you're tracking your vehicle, but uh, towing a five foot by eight foot trailer with the Crosstrek just isn't the same thing. Um, with the numbers I found, it really looks like the engine would overheat long before 
uh, the CBT would. And so really looking at the numbers, it seems like the balance is a bit off here. Um, it would be better to go with a smaller capacity CVT cooler and then combine it with a smaller capacity oil cooler. Um, it doesn't really seem like you need either of those things though if you're just towing a 5 by 8 U-Haul uh, over interstate highways. Um, but it seems like a, a nice thing to have if you're out in hill country perhaps. Um, so if you do need anything like the massive uh, Mishimoto CVT cooler for the uh, WRX on your cross track, I would imagine you're probably exceeding the tow limits, um, and that's not good, so just, just something to think about. As far as next steps are concerned, the, the next thing I want to do on the Crosstrek, even before downsizing the CVT cooler, is to introduce a thermostat in line with the CVT cooler, because um, right now the flow out of the factory cooler and warmer is uh, unregulated, so the CVT uh, fluid is being continuously pumped. Uh, through this very large heat exchanger um, without any sort of temperature control. That doesn't seem to have been an issue so far, um, but now it's actually starting to get cold outside as we move into fall, and that means the CVT might not heat up its uh, fluid to an ideal temperature. That could mean the fluid is not at a good viscosity, um, could mean it wouldn't lubricate the CVT properly, and uh, that could generate some excessive wear in the transmission. So that's it. That's my experience towing uh, with the Subaru Crosstrek, my first ever Subaru adventure. Um, had no trouble towing a five foot by eight foot uh, trailer as long as you follow Subaru's recommendations. Um, that 2.5 liter in the sport trim and the uh, limited trim, uh, that definitely helps. And also the Mishimoto CVT cooler for the WRX can be used in pinch, but uh, it's way too oversized for the Crosstrek, so I advise against it. Anyway, that's it for now. I want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you down the road.